Good morning, church. Believe it or not, today is the last Sunday of Lent, and I'm not sure how I really feel about it. In some ways, I feel like I've hardly had any Lent at all this year. The coronavirus has disrupted our bodybuilding sessions and pretty much everything else we had planned. In other ways, though, I've had way too much Lent. All this social distancing and self-isolation has caused me, caused all of us, to give up a lot more than I ever anticipated or intended. So in light of this strange Lent that has been, I thought it would be helpful for us to return to the place where it all began, way back on Ash Wednesday, to reorient ourselves by revisiting Matthew 6, which is the traditional gospel reading for the start of Lent. Matthew 6 is a leg of the Sermon on the Mount, this famous series of instructions and exhortations Jesus gives his disciples for living the new life to which he calls us. The spiritual and charitable practices we often associate with Lent are pulled straight from Jesus' teachings here. Almsgiving, which is the giving of money and necessities to those in need, prayer, and of course, fasting. The refrain that unites Jesus' teaching on all three of these subjects is, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like those who don't really mean it. It's not just that we should engage in these practices, but how we engage these practices that matters. When you give to the needy, Jesus says, don't show it off. You're doing it for their benefit, not for yours. You're doing it to help them, not to promote yourself. If you're giving because you want other people to applaud you for it, then there's nothing noble or holy about your generosity. It's the same way with prayer. We shouldn't word or structure our prayers to impress other people with our polished language or our pious God speak. When we pray, it should be plain and honest. Our prayers should flow from our desire to commune with God, to praise God, to pray for God's coming kingdom, to seek forgiveness, and to ask for what we need, to pray with God as well as to God. And as you've probably guessed, Jesus says we should fast in the same genuine way that we should give and pray. Fasting isn't for show. It's not something we do to prove how godly we are. The only person who needs to see, who needs to know that we're fasting, is God. Fasting really is the quintessential Lenten practice. That's where the whole concept of giving something up for Lent comes from. Giving up coffee or chocolate for the season is a form of fasting, and I've done that plenty of times, but I must confess, fasting as a spiritual discipline is something I've struggled with. Now, fasting is always a bit of a struggle when you practice it. That's part of the point. But what I mean is I struggle to understand the purpose of it, the benefit of it. I just didn't get it for a long time. I identify with Brian McLaren, who once commented at a conference, fasting doesn't bring me closer to God, it brings me closer to pizza. That pretty much summed up my attitude toward fasting until one Lent when I really gave myself over to it. That year, I did a solidarity fast for the 40 days of Lent, choosing to live off the daily food allowance of someone living on the United States federal minimum wage. By my calculations, that amount came to $1.07 per meal. That's it. It was tough. I was hungry at some point most days, especially in the early going. But it was such a meaningful experience. It really opened my eyes to the daily struggles of a good many people for whom there was no feast waiting at the end of the season. It also showed me the value of fasting for the journey of faith following in the footsteps of Jesus. Fasting teaches us that we are not and we do not have to be slaves of our appetites, our urges, our cravings. Appetite is so often how the adversary tempts us. Heck, it's even how he tempted Jesus in the wilderness, a story we can read just prior to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 4. First, the adversary tempts Jesus with his physical appetite. If you're hungry, turn these stones into bread. 
Next, he tempts Jesus with his appetite, his longing for control, for authority, for agency. You can rule over all that you see if you will simply bow down and worship me. Finally, he tempts Jesus with his appetite, his desire for recognition. Throw yourself off the temple. Let the angels catch you. Let the world see and praise you for who you are. These aren't just temptations Jesus faced. They're temptations we all face, especially in a, consum a consumer society that constantly urges us to give in to our appetites, our longings, our cravings. Buy this car, eat at this restaurant, take this vacation, go on this adventure. You need this thing to know, to feel like you've arrived, that you matter, that you really are someone. All of it can and should be yours. Not next year, not next month, right now. Don't wait. Fasting matters because fasting is a resistance to all that. Fasting reminds us that we don't really need all those things, no matter how hungry for them we may be in the moment. Because, as Jesus told the adversary, we don't live by bread alone. We aren't measured simply by what we consume. We're so much more than any of that. Our value, our calling, lies within God, within us, within the image of God that inhabits all of us. So fasting is resistance. It's also preparation for that resistance. Fasting prepares us for cycles of trial and triumph, waiting and acting, for struggles and celebrations. That's not just the rhythm of the liturgical year as Lent gives way to Easter and as Advent gives way to Christmas. That's the rhythm of a life. We all live and experience peaks and valleys. Engaging in fasting is a spiritual discipline with God, with self, with each other, especially when we find ourselves on one of those mountains, strengthens us and teaches us, teaches us patience, teaches us to say no, teaches us to push through, and helps us to find our way through the valley when the valley arrives. And the valley always arrives. It's not a question of if but when and how deep and dark and long it will be. But we can prepare and train in the valley too. That's one of the best things about the good news of Christ's gospel. With God, with Jesus, it's never too late. So even though the calendar season of Lent is drawing to a close, and even if you haven't been intentional about engaging these Lenten practices, I want to encourage you to start embracing them in these days of social distancing and self-isolation because this wilderness season is going to stretch far beyond Easter. I truly believe that if we will devote ourselves to giving to those in need, to praying regularly and honestly to God, and perhaps especially to approaching this time of isolation as a form of fasting, these disciplines will help all of us to draw closer to God, closer to each other, and help us develop the spiritual stamina we need to make it through. Spiritual practices such as these help us clarify what's really important. They reveal what truly matters to God and what we really see as mattering to us. They show us where our hearts and our desires truly lie. And where our treasure is, Jesus says, that's where our hearts truly are. Now, treating all of this social isolation as a fast might strike you as a bit disingenuous. After all, we're not choosing to fast from so much of life, from so many things we love and enjoy. This is a fast being thrust upon us, decided for us by our government and necessitated by a particularly contagious and deadly virus. It may not seem very spiritual, but let's remember that Jesus' time in the wilderness was thrust upon him, too. Following his baptism, the Spirit carried Jesus into the wilderness. The Gospel of Mark actually states that the Spirit threw Jesus, hurled Jesus into the wilderness. This wasn't an experience of Jesus choosing, but he did have to choose how he would respond to it, how he would respond to the wilderness itself itself, 
and how he'd respond to the temptations that arose from within that wilderness. Let's remember, too, that going back to the very beginning, to the time of Moses and the exodus from Egypt, wilderness is where God has formed God's people. It's where we learn. It's where we grow. It's the training camp where we come to understand who God is and who we are in relation to God what we know and what we don't, what we are now, and what we can become. So as God's people, as Jesus' people, we need the wilderness. We may not like it, but we need it. Still, we can take comfort, and I hope you will, in knowing that Christ is the Lord of the wilderness as well as the Lord of the promised land. He's the good shepherd of our struggles as well as our successes. He's the Messiah of the cross as well as the empty tomb. He's our brother and our friend as well as our Lord and our Savior who faced and overcame the temptations of the wilderness. There's nowhere we can go that Christ hasn't already been. There's no place to which we can rise or fall where Christ isn't willing to go. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, and he is very much here with us in the midst of all this wilderness, as he is in every wilderness, helping us to find our way through it and calling us to so much more beyond it. And that, my friends, is good news. Thanks.